great morning. Yes. You know, that's, I, I think that's the first time I've ever used that type of expression, but I can't think of an expression more fitting to describe a Sunday morning. It is a, it is a great morning when we as saints, when we as brothers and sisters in Christ can fellowship with one another, open up God's Word, see what it has to say and, and how we can improve our lives and, and make us walk a little bit more um, and strive with Him. I can't think of a better way to start out, start out the day than, than worshiping with you all. And uh, I, I really appreciate the song that Brother, Brother Boone opened us up with, let's forget about ourselves and magnify His name and worship Him. That's a, that's, a, that's a bluntly worded song, but I love it. So let's, so, so let's forget about ourselves and magnify His name and let's worship Him. You know, one of the greatest blessings is that we can read the Bible in its completeness. You know, we can read of things that people wish that they could have seen with their own eyes after studying the, the, the law and studying the Old Testament all their lives um, and, and, and studying uh, from the prophets like Isaiah, of, of the prophecies that they were making them, we can read about the fulfillment of a lot of those prophecies in the New Testament. You know, I think that's, sometimes I forget about that. You know, how cool it is that we can, we can read of the book that, that contains all things pertaining to life and godliness, as it says in 2 Peter 1 verse 3. And we can read the fulfillment of prophecies that a lot of people can't say that they've seen or been able to read of them being fulfilled. And one of those prophecies that we're going to mention uh, this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. But we can also find that in Luke chapter 8, verse 10. And Luke chapter 8 is kind of going to serve as our main kind of guide this morning. That's going to be our main text of reference, so to speak. So let's turn to eight, Luke chapter 8, verse 10. Or Luke chapter 8 in general. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Luke chapter 8. Now, who, who here, who, oh man, I can speak, I can. Who here knows of the title for this morning's lesson? Please. Okay, I got one person. Sweet. Well, I'll tell you. Um, the title of this morning's lesson is Contingent Christianity. Now, who here thinks that, that that's kind of an odd title? I thought it was. Um, and and I, I hope that some people, you know, maybe think that's a that's a little bit odd title, you know, contingent Christianity. What, what really, what, what do you mean by that? And, that? and if you're wondering that, that accomplished the, what I was going for. I wanted to kind of pique someone's interest uh, because that just sounds really weird. We don't really use for one, we don't really use that word a lot. Contingent, um, you know, what really, what 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 all is that talking about? And I, and I think that. Before I kind of get into why I, I titled this lesson uh, and, 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 and pertaining to Luke chapter 8, let's kind of define that word a little bit. Can't go wrong with starting off with definitions. I know that's what a lot of preachers do. and I, I, I don't want to be that guy, but I think I have to be that guy this morning. So contingent Christianity. Contingent, when I looked up its definition, is in its definition is subject to change. So subject to change, and there's another uh, definition, which is existing only if certain circumstances are the case. So you kind of keep that in mind. The definition of contingent is that which is subject to change or existing only if certain circumstances are the case. And hopefully at, by the time that we end this, we conclude this lesson, We'll see this really kind of this definition apply in this in this chapter pertaining to Christianity. Because, brethren, I I've noticed we're living in a world where one's Christianity is subject to change, and only existing if certain circumstances are the case. Do y'all do y'all see that as well? It could just it could just be me, but I see that a lot. In fact, you know, I, I thought for a moment the title of this lesson, instead of having a contingent 
Christianity, to shoot for and to strive for a consistent Christianity. Because in a lot of cases, our faith is subject to change. If the right circumstances are the case, our faith is fine. But it, it can get completely rattled if the circumstances are not ideal. So let's, 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 let's read about this in Luke chapter 8 because we'll, we get to see this kind of come, come to life a little bit in this chapter. So we started, and, and thank you for the person who read, uh, he started in verse 4, and I hope you brought your Bibles, we will be doing a lot of reading. I don't, like, I don't like to not have a lesson where there's not some reading. I just, don't, I just don't like that. I don't trust my words more than I trust God. So Luke chapter 8 verse 4, we're going to start in verse 4. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and it, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as it, and as it soon sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So one, one thing that we're going to notice, you see, there's, there's a lot of different ways that we can take the, the title contingent Christianity. In some ways, our faith is kind of contingent. Um, I, I believe that if we do not have the right heart, if our, if our heart doesn't possess the right conditions to where the gospel can be planted and received and obeyed, I think that that will definitely have a part to play in our growth or the lack of growth thereof. You know, can, can we kind of see that? I, 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 think, I think that this, that's what it's talking about. But we read later on, and I'm going to skip down to verse, verse 11. We can read verses 9 through, 9 through 10, but uh, let's focus on skipping to verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, and lest they should believe and be saved. So here, here we're reading about our, our first type of soil, the wayside soil. And this is the kind of soil where one's heart, and I believe that all these soil types, um, from, from my studies, is, is talking about, this, when it's talking about soil and the conditions of your soil, it's kind of talking about the, your, your, the conditions of your heart. How there, there are different hearts, and this is how they perceive the, the, the word that is being sown in them, the, the seed, the word of God, like it says in verse 11. So we're, we're talking about the conditions of the heart, so to speak. So we read about our first type of heart, our first type of soil, which is the wayside soil. And now this is, this is the type of condition where there's a greater influence, the devil has a greater influence than the word of God can have on you. And thus it, it brings to no effect. You know, because it, it, as, as, as we read in verse 12, you know, the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe in and, and be saved. But we start in the beginning of verse 12, like I should have. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. So they hear the word. It, it, it comes, but the devil has a greater influence than that, than that word ever can, than the word of God can ever have, that, that that seed can ever have. So the devil can take that away and brings, brings it no effect. That person is never going to... Oh, obey or adhere to never going, that plant's never going to grow up there, it's just not going to amount to anything there's that condition which is um, I mean we definitely see that kind of condition in the world you know we, we, we see if people where that you can preach to them with the Bible all the, all the time and you can you can word a great lesson so eloquently like I always do I'm, just, I'm totally kidding I know that I, sometimes I'm not the best at words I, I'm not going to apologize for that I, I am human and I, and I heard from a criticism that I'm going to try to adhere to. I, I never want to sound like I am apologetic of, of me preaching. I, 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 don't, I don't want to ever sound that way, but I do acknowledge the fact that I am an imperfect person. And so if I ever not convey, an, if I don't convey an idea as, as well as it could have been, I apologize for that. I'm still growing in that. And, and, that's, and that's why I welcome criticism. But you know, you, you, I could even have the best words possible, and I could and I could preach to some people, and 
Or, 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 or we can all preach to some people and it just doesn't, doesn't do anything. They can hear it. And that's where faith starts. It's not Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you can, you can preach to them the, a perfectly written word. You can, straight out of the Bible, you can't get much more perfect than that. But if, if, that, if that heart is so hard, it's to no effect. So that's the first kind of soil, and it kind of warns us to protect our heart. To have our heart to where it can, God, can, God can mold with it. God can, our, our heart is uh, pious. You know, it's, uh, I believe I'm using that word correctly. I, never, I, I don't use that word very often. But our heart's open to the Word of God, to where we can shape and, and cultivate a plant, and it can grow in our life. So that's the, that's the first type of soil. And then we read in the next one in verse 13. But the ones, and, and this is the rocky soil, but the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, they receive the word with joy. And these have no root. Who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. We see that happen a lot of times too, do we not? You'll see some people that are really excited. You know, I, I love Sundays. Yeah, I love hearing, you know, preach, preach to me. I want to hear it. But there's really no, it, it doesn't take root. It doesn't take root in their life when they, when they leave from here, and that's, that's about where it ends. And they continue going and doing whatever they want to do, and then, and then when the temptation that they, what they want to do is greater. So the first one, the, the influence of the devil was greater than the, than the Word of God, and this one, temptation is kind of greater than that, than than the word, than the seed. And there's that that type of soil type to where it won't it won't grow. It'll it'll fall away. There's that type of soil type, and then there's another one. And starting in verse 14, now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with the cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. And sadly, this is I think this is the kind of soil type that especially people within the church need to be weary of or conscientious of. It is so easy to get consumed by the cares of the world. It's so easy to get consumed by riches. You know, I, I, I can tell you all this. I, I I'm, I'm just got out of school. Uh, well, at least high school. I've still got a ton of college. And that's a kind of expensive but you know, one thing that's really emphasized is the idea of riches. You know, how you define success, what should be the most important thing to you is the sense of financial stability. You know, that's how you can define, this is what a lot of people, this is how they define success is, you know, you have a ridiculously great salary to where you never have to worry about finance. You know, if you're, if you're able to provide a, a really great paycheck um, you know, you did your part. And I, and I don't believe that that's necessarily the case. It's certainly not the case in what the Bible emphasizes to be the most important thing. Right? Because we've read First Timothy chapter 6 and all the things that it has to say about riches. In fact, let, let's kind of turn there really quick. First Timothy chapter 6. Because this is, I think, a really, really important thing to kind of hammer in today. I know it's something that I have to remind myself of a lot and how I choose professions and how, how I'm managing my time because it's really easy to fall victim to um, you know, your, one's Christianity being contingent on your financial stability. Because what, it, even if it's not really verbalized, it's kind of implied by some people to where you... They, they, they have this mentality of, you know, my Christianity is fine as long as my finances are in order. You know, I don't have to, I don't really have to give. If I, if I, you know, that might put, that might, that, that, that might hurt a little bit. I'm actually, I'm, sa I'm saving up for something else. Or, you know, it's, it's really, my, my Christianity is fine as long as, as long as things are going my way. Um, you know, where I don't really have that many cares going on. Um, you know, as long as those circumstances are kind of filled, I'm good. My Christianity is solid. You can build on it. It's fine. It's good. As long as these certain circumstances are, 
happening in my life, then you know those are kind of out of my control. So, you know, if if God allows these things to happen in my life, you know, I think that I have the right to kind of back away from them a little bit. That's that's some people. That's sadly that is some people's mentality, and and I'm trying not to. And, and sometimes I I I fall victim of thinking like this, to where I'll put the I'll put the cares and of of this world more important than. How am I looking spiritually? And 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 and, and something that I I got to do is I got to focus on First Timothy chapter six. I hope you all have time to turn there. Let's start in verse three. If anyone teaches otherwise and who does not consent to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, or reviling. Evil with suspensions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Now, starting in verse 6. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain when we can carry nothing out. Sorry, I have to apologize. I have to turn the page. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. <coughs> By those who desire to be rich, fall into temptation as a, and a snare, and to many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, and, and we can almost all quote this, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. You, we, hear that, we hear that a lot. We preach it a lot. We say it a lot. We know what the passage says. Yet, we find that, that being a really big struggle for... I think, I think that we've, we've all kind of fallen victim in, in, into this a little bit. Or at least I know I, I have with me. But we don't have to. We should, we should never let the, the, the cares of this world surpass in, some, in, in importance... To our spiritual lives, our spiritual affairs. Now we read of the good soil. Going back to Luke chapter 8. And I really wish I would have left another marker. <laughs> but going back to Luke chapter 8, we read of the good soil. Starting in verse 15. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word, with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. And there's a couple words in there that I think are really easy to overlook, but I'd like to kind of highlight a little bit. For one, keeping it. Did, did, did y'all notice that? For the ones that, and I'm reading from the New King James. I don't, I don't necessarily know if this aligns perfectly with whatever translation. But the ones that fell on the good ground. They have a good and noble heart, and they keep the word. But what about what, what about if the circumstances are not ideal? It's easy to keep the word if the circumstances are ideal. If you have no cares or no no temptations, I, I would say it, it would be considerably easier for you to be a Christian than someone who has a lot of vices and a lot of temptations and a lot of snares, and their and their heart is really kind of subject to change. You know, they're kind of tossed to and fro. We talked about that a couple weeks ago um, when examining kind of the, the, the church in Ephesians chapter 4. You know, one of the ways that we could distinguish like a solid Christian and, and those that are or may not as, as mature in the faith is, is how easy they are to just change directions, you know. Um, like I said in, in Ephesians chapter 4, I believe it's in verse 13. You know, you would have some that would just go, if they, they hear this doctrine, it sounds good, and they would turn to that. But, the, but the, those that were really solid... They were able to speak the truth. They knew the truth, and they were founded on that. They kept it, and were able to speak it with love, right? Hopefully, I was able to convey that a couple weeks ago. If I didn't, I'm not going to apologize because my, my the sister over here says not to apologize. Um, but then again, not apologizing is kind of sounding like you're apologetic. That's nonetheless. I'm going to I'm going to kind of drop that. But this is a this is a huge thing. We keep. We keep the word. We keep it close to our heart. So that way it stays there. It can grow. 
We have to, we have to continue, we continue to have that, that and strive for that type of right soil to where we can cultivate a plant. So one part of it is keeping it, right? The keeping the Word of God. And the other part is patience. And this is why I, I believe that this, this type of soil type can grow no matter the circumstances that may arise. I mean, be, because it says this word patience. At, at, at the very end, it says, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Does it, may, may it take a little bit more time than what we want to be able to see our Christian lives bearing fruit? I believe so. It take it take it takes a while. It, you know, I and I, I can only speak in my own life to where I'm 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 just like man, why 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 haven't I learned this concept more? You know, like I said, you know, the, the whole financial thing. I know the passages, and you, you can even go to Matthew chapter six, where God talks, or where Jesus talks about finances and how we're not supposed to really even worry about the things of this world because we can't add a cubit to our stature, right? We can't change a lot of things. We can't change the you know the color of our hair on our head. And I apologize that was one word there. We can't change the color of the hair on our head. We can't do a lot of things, so why are we worrying? You know, it's really easy for us to know that, but to apply it. And for us to really learn it and for that to take root in our life and to where we can apply it and and we can see us applying it may take some time, and it's hard. Christianity is the hardest religion. I definitely believe that Christianity is the hardest religion to practice. <laughs> a lot of people think that you know, there's a lot of merit in the Islamic religion where it's so systematic, and you, know, you do this and this and this, and it's like, look how regimented they are. And then you, but then you also see, And I'm, I'm trying not to speak for every one of them, but also how flawed that religion is and, and how they can treat other people. And their, and their doctrine, I believe, justifies it. You know, it's, it's, it, it, I think that it, it may be considerably easier to follow that religion than it is the religion that says that you're supposed to love your enemies. What in the world? That's hard. It, I mean, you, you, you control um, your... You're trying to bridle everything, and you deny yourself and take up a cross. That's a hard. That's a hard religion to follow, if it's followed correctly. But it's 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 difficult. But we keep, we just got to be patient, and being patient is difficult. <laughs> you know, we have to have something that's difficult for us to be able to see that kind of growth. You know, we read um, in, in, in James chapter one. I'm going to turn there really quick. But James chapter 1, the, kind of the necessity of patience. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I think this passage kind of makes it clear. In order for us to have patience, for us to be able to produce patience, we have to have our faith tested. I'm a, I'm a current student, so that four-letter word test is probably the most terrifying word of all, all, all words right now. In fact, I'm, I'm worried about another four-letter word, quiz tomorrow that I should have probably done a little bit more studying for. You know, the te testing, that is, I think we all kind of have some, oof, we don't like tests. We don't like that, None, no. But sometimes it could be beneficial. Our faith can never be tested. We can never endure something that we cannot possibly overcome with the help of our Lord. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If I'm not mistaken, in verses 11 and 12. But again, and I never want anyone to think that I'm, I'm preaching to them and not preaching to myself. But I hope that from this morning's lesson that I've, I've, I've been able to bring, bring to light some things that we probably all know and have heard. But may have needed to hear um, about one aspect of our life. And, and then again, I, I can only speak for my own life. I've, I know that I've hit on several things that I needed to hear 
So I only hope that it was it was encouraging for for you all. And of course, I, I never I never want anyone to, to think that I'm not I'm not preaching this out of love. But it is so easy. It is so easy to have a contingent Christianity rather than a consistent Christianity. We have to keep the word. We have to uh, 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 have, have patience to where we can constantly have God in our lives and then we can see those fruits that we're hope, you know, trying to, trying to our, our best to attain. But it takes patience and it takes time and it takes a lot of work. So, while we're all here, let's all help one another. Help, help one another to, and, and, and open up our, and, and, and tell, tell you, brother, I'm struggling with this in my heart. Can you please pray for me? I mean, that's what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to have that element. Christianity is hard. It, it's going to be way harder if, you, if we try to do it alone without our brothers and sisters in Christ. If you have a need, if you if you if you if, if you if you've heard the word and have believed it, and have o- obeyed it in, in, in terms of repenting of one's sins, and confessing Christ's name before, among others, like it says in Matthew ten thirty two, and repenting, like it says in Luke chapter thirteen verse three, and you've heard the word and believe, and you believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, as it says in John chapter eight verse twenty four. If we don't believe, and and Him, we will die in our sins. And, and, and I put on Christ in baptism, like it says in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. But I've fallen short. Luckily, according to 1 John chapter 1, I believe it's verse 9, where, where God is faithful to forgive us of our sins if we confess them, we can always seek forgiveness. We all, we all mess up. We all fall short. Our souls may, may not always be perfect. But luckily... We serve a perfect God who is omnibenevolent. He is all loving. Or if one if one would like to begin their life, begin trying to um, change one's life to where it can produce spiritual fruits, and, and where, where one would like to change from a, uh, allowing oneself to control the direction of one's life to where you allow Christ to have a control in your life. I I. I beseech you to do it. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is becoming a Christian and keeping up with it. Things are really hard right now, but you have a home and you have an eternal life if we live faithfully until the end. Like it says in Revelation 2.10, even to the point of death, we can have a crown of life. We can have an everlasting life if we live obediently. I find that to be so encouraging. If you have a need at all this morning, we'd love to help you as we stand and sing.